Good evening and welcome. My name is Ian Harris and I have served on the uh, board of the World Peace Council for over 10 years now and I've been very much involved in the education program. Uh, before I get started, please can everyone take a moment to make sure that you silence your cell phones and electronic devices. And we do encourage you to tweet after our speakers' remarks. I also invite you to like the World Affairs Council on Facebook. Before we begin, there are a few events that I'd like to tell you about. First, on Wednesday, October the 17th, compensations are Kenneth Feinberg, recently announced as the mediator of the Penn State and Dusky Victims Compensation Fund, joins us to discuss his experience with a number of other high-profile claims including the compensation funds for the 9 11 attacks and the BP Gulf oil spill. Just in time for the 2012 presidential election, join us on Friday, October 26, for election 2012 discussion with Donna Brazil and Michael Spagonish, followed by our traditional election year party, including the council's famous bellwether mock election, which predicted the winner of the last five presidential elections. Votes are for sale, so please vote early <laughs> and often. Proceeds to benefit the Council's Education Program. And on Friday, November the 7th, we will continue our timely discussion about unrest in the Middle East and North Africa with Afghanistan's Ryan Crocker. <clears throat> Most recently, Ambassador Crocker held the top post in Afghanistan. But he also served as such in Pakistan, Syria, and Lebanon, home of today's guest of honor. This event will be held in Randolph, Pennsylvania. We also have another exciting travel opportunity, so please be sure to pick up our travel brochures in the lobby. I saw Joe Russell here too. Uh, your membership and participation in the Council directly supports our claims student educational programs which serves as a group of over 2,000 middle and high school students in 80 area schools. These year-long learning programs help foster the skills and sensibilities students will need in order to thrive and compete in a knowledge-based global community. And having served on the uh, Education Committee, I can vouch for having attended some of the mock um, sessions, be it um, the G30 Summit, for the International Court of Justice and it's amazing what these students do to prepare for the event and how they engage themselves. And that's a key part of what we support. We are pleased to present tonight's program in cooperation with the World Affairs Councils of America and through a grant from the Carnegie Corporation of New York. We'd also like to thank Sabina and Raza Bakari Foundation for its support of tonight's program. And now I am delighted to Welcome Rami Khoury to the Council's podium. Mr. Khoury is a widely respected journalist, an internationally syndicated political columnist, and a renowned scholar. He is Palestinian Jordanian educated in both the Middle East and the US. And his work reflects that bridge which spans the interests of both the Middle East and the West. He joins us tonight to discuss the effects of the Arab uprisings offering his analyses of the changes, changes Muslim societies are experiencing, and that offer some insights into the anti-American rage that's unfolding in pockets of the Muslim world. Rami Khoury is the first director of the Islam Affairs Institute for Public Policy and International Affairs at the American University of Beirut, as well as the editor at large of the Daily Star, the largest English language newspaper in Lebanon, and the Middle East. His daily star column, A View from the Arab World, explores myriad issues from North Africa to Indonesia. Mr. Khoury is also a senior fellow at Harvard's Kennedy School. This fall, he is teaching at Villanova University and Northeastern University in Boston. I mentioned that Mr. Khoury's work, indeed his life, bridges the Middle East and the West. I would be remiss if I didn't share an excellent example such. Rami Khoury spent many years as chief umpire of the Little League Baseball in Jordan. 
Please join me in welcoming, welcome, welcoming Mr. Rami Kuri. Mechanisms of 
the exercise of power, systems of accountability, national values, foreign policies. It's the first time ever that all of these critical dimensions of statehood are being determined by the citizens of some of these countries. That's really historic. It's never happened before, and it's happening in several countries simultaneously. The second point is that this is historical in the sense that this process will take many, many decades to unfold and to be completed. And in a way, you can say these processes are never completed, these state-building processes. Look at your recent um, presidential, uh, let's say, if you look at the Republican candidates who are running for president for, to be the presidential candidate, the incredible debate they have about things like the role of religion in public life or immigration or religious values and, and some of the same issues that people have been debating in this country for 225 years uh, and, and you're still debating. So this is a historical process that will go on for many years because, as I will explain later, there isn't just an overthrow of regimes taking place. What you, ha what you have happening simultaneously, compressed into about a year and nine months now, are processes of historical change and national development and state building that in some countries, including yours, took about 200 years to be completed. So that you have a war of liberation, a war of independence, a constitutional convention and a constitutional uh, state uh, consensus building process under your new constitution. You had elements of the civil war that you had in the 1860s. You had elements of the civil rights movement that you had in the 20th century. You had elements of ideological tensions, labor movements, social justice movements. All of these things are happening simultaneously. Whereas in most countries, including yours, they happen sequentially over a period of about one to two centuries. And they're happening within a period of one year or nine months so far. So to understand that incredible compression of historical processes in such a short period of time is one reason why it looks like, when you look at Egypt in particular, it looks like things are flip-flopping. One day they do this, one day they do that. But I think if you see that this is a historical process that takes many, many decades or centuries in most countries, it helps us understand it a little bit better. Also, there are 22 countries in the Arab world. And we've had now uprisings in six, uh, Tunisia, Libya, Egypt, Syria, Bahrain, and Yemen. Three leaders have been overthrown in North Africa. The leader of Yemen was changed, but the system hasn't fully changed. And Bahrain and Syria are still in tension. While in many other countries like Morocco and Jordan and Kuwait and others, you don't have revolutions, but you have serious pressure from within society on the leadership to bring about constitutional and political change. In other words, every country is a little bit different. The trajectory of change in every country will be different because the conditions are different, the legitimacy of the ruling regime is different, the economic situation is different, and therefore there's a big variety in terms of what is happening in these countries as this process of change takes place. So the best, I think, that I can do now is simply to go over in the bullet form uh, what is actually new, what are we seeing here when we look back over the last year and nine months um, and we see, we try to identify what is significant, what is new and what seems to be lasting. And I would give you a list of uh, bullet point headlines. The first thing we're seeing is a whole series of new legitimacies. We have legitimate governments, we have legitimate institutions of governance like parliaments, the court system, we have legitimate political actors who are legitimate in the eyes of their own people, political parties, different groups. There's a whole series of new legitimacies, including most importantly the legitimacy of the exercise of power. The second thing we have related to that is a whole set of new accountabilities that people who exercise power legitimately, 
in other words, they're chosen, ratified, validated by their own people. People who exercise power, whether it's a president or a judge or a political party or a prime minister or a government bureaucrat, whoever it is, is accountable now in a way that they never were before in the modern Arab world. They're accountable to the other branches of government. They're accountable to the media and public opinion. They're accountable to pressures from lobby groups, the private sector, special interest groups, professional groups. They're accountable to the voters, most importantly. There is a whole set of new accountabilities that provides uh, both a check on the, on the, on the tendency uh, of some institutions or individuals to become absolute leaders and corrupt and inefficient, and that the, these accountabilities also generate much greater efficiency. Because people in power now, if they don't deliver what their voters and citizens expect from them, they will be voted out of office. Uh, so accountabilities are incredibly important as the driving force uh, for both uh, legitimacy and efficiency in, in government systems. The third thing we have that's really new is a whole set of new actors. Actors who are in the public political arena. The interesting thing about this set of new actors is they're all new, but none of them are new. And what I mean by that is the actors I'm talking about are political parties, civil society organizations, the armed forces, if you take Egypt, for instance, the armed forces is a political actor now. They, they give and take and they negotiate. Uh, you have uh, football clubs who are playing a role uh, in the uh, process of public debate and engagement in various ways. You have civil society organizations. You have businessmen's uh, associations. Uh, you, you have... Uh, uh, young revolutionaries, the young kids who are out in the streets who are now still trying to find their role. You have Islamic groups like the Mainstream Muslim Brotherhood, which is now in power in Egypt in the coalition. You have the hardline Salafist groups who are non-violent but more fundamentalist, uh, equivalent to say uh, very uh, strict Christian fundamentalists in this country. Um, and you have various other groups. All of these are new political actors in the public arena. They're all legitimate, and they're all playing the game according to the new rules that are available. None of them are new. They were all in Egypt before. What's new is that they're now all acting in the public sphere and legitimately. And some of them will win and some of them will lose. And there will be governments created and some of them will be out of government and some will be in government. But having this range range of political actors operating in the public sphere is significant. The other thing that's important about that is they keep evolving, they keep changing. One of the misconceptions of the Arab world that is perpetrated, especially by the mainstream media in this country, is that the Arab world is somehow uh, monocolored and static. That Arabs are like this, they're violent. They're religious, they're docile, they're whatever. They're, they're anti-American, they're anti-Israeli, whatever it is. But all Arabs are colored in one brush, and they're, and they're all like that. And that's how they were born, and that's how they live. The reality is completely different. The reality is that there's a wide range of views in the Arab world, which now have come out into the public. They were never allowed to come out into the public before because they had these dictatorships. And the second thing is they're constantly evolving. The Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, when they ran for the parliament last June, a year or so after the overthrow of the regime, they won like 50 to 60 percent of the seats of parliament. Then there was a gap of about four or five months until they had presidential elections. In that period, the people in Egypt could watch the Muslim Brotherhood in action in parliament, and they weren't impressed. The Muslim Brotherhood didn't do a very good job. They were mostly sloganeering. They didn't really address the issues that the Egyptians cared about, jobs, and clean water, lack of corruption, etc. And then when the presidential elections happened four months after the parliamentary election, the Muslim Brotherhood's share of the voters dropped from around 60% to around 25%. And that's a sign 
that uh, these people in power are now accountable. The voters will support people who do what the voters want and serve the citizens, and they'll get rid of the people that they don't want. And the politicians will change accordingly. They will respond to the uh, will of the voters, and they're, after all, politicians. No offense to any politicians in the but politicians <laughs> do that. They respond to the electorate. That's their job. Their job is to win elections and to govern. Uh, and, and so this is an incredibly important new phase where we have these legitimate, accountable uh, public officials who evolve in, 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 evolve in a positive sense so that they respond to what the citizenry wants. We have new institutions, uh, parliament I mentioned, but we have things like political parties that are starting to be born, civil society organizations, media, businessmen's groups, business people's groups, all kinds of uh, women's groups, uh, local community groups, uh, new institutions that are all operating in the public sphere that never had much opportunity to really do anything before. Most importantly, we have new rules. New rules of how power is exercised and how the public sphere operates. And the new rules essentially are manifested in new constitutions. Um, and constitutions is something you know about in this city. Um, the, the constitutional process takes a long time. And it takes a long time because it is not written by the political victor. It is a process of consensus of an entire citizenry. And this is a process that has never happened before in the Arab world. Never ever have Arab citizens of any country been consulted about their constitution. Now they are being consulted. And there's a tremendously dynamic debate going on in Tunis and Egypt and Libya, the three most advanced countries. They're debating the role of women, they're debating the role of Islam, the role of religion in public life, they're debating the power of the press, the role of the private sector, the role of international donors. There's a whole a range of issues that are being widely and seriously debated by the people of these countries to come up with these constitutions. There will be first drafts coming out in the next three, four months, and then they'll be put to national discussion, referenda, and then they'll be agreed upon, and there'll be a new parliamentary election. So this is a process that has just started to really hit its stride. But the development of new constitutions strikes me as the single most important milestone because it represents the beginning of the rule of law. Uh, and just as a sidelight here, uh, the rule of law in Arabic, for most Arabs, for most of whom are Muslims, is what sharia is. You've probably heard the word sharia. You think of it as people cutting off the hands of a thief, probably, because that's the only thing you hear about sharia here. The root word in Arabic for, for legitimacy and rule of law, sharia, is the same word. Uh, Sharia and Sharia. It's the same word. Sharia means the rule of law for Muslims and most Arabs. And it means having a society organized according to rules that are fair, that are accepted by the citizenry, and that are impartially and efficiently implemented by uh, a judiciary. So we have the process starting now where the rule book, the constitutions are being written, and the next step is to make sure that they're implemented uh, fairly. And there's extraordinary evolutions and changes uh, taking place where, for instance, the Muslim brothers, everybody feared the Muslim brothers if they're going to win, they're going to make an Islamic state, they're going to be like Iran. Uh, and there was tremendous uh, contestation in Egypt and Tunisia so far about issues, for instance, like the role of women. That the Muslim brothers wanted to say that a woman's role is complementary to the man rather than equal to the man. And there was a massive debate, and they have these conservative, old-fashioned views, which are the same kind of views that pertained in this country when your independence happened, when women didn't have the vote, and black people didn't have the vote, and your great democracy was a democracy of white men who owned land and slaves, and nobody else mattered, nobody else had any rights in the 1770s. And so people go through these processes at the beginning of their constitutional life where there's partial rights, and then they, they evolve, and the Arabs are going through something similar. But it's happening so fast that within the last two months, there was huge pushback against the Muslim Brothers in Tunisia and in Egypt uh, about the role of Islam, for instance. The Muslim Brothers wanted to say Islam is the sole source of, of uh, laws. 
And most of the people said, no, it's not the sole source of Torah, because there's people in our societies who are Christians, and there's a few Jews still in some Arab societies, not many of them. Uh, and they said, no, you can't have uh, only Islam being the source of law. So they said, Islam is the main source of law, but not the only source of law. And in Tunis, there's a big debate about uh, a declaration of the Constitution, which some people wanted to say that Tunisia is an Islamic Arab state. And some Tunisians said, you can't do that, because many Tunisians are not Arab, culturally, they're Berber, and many Tunisians are not Muslim. Uh, there's some Jews, there's a few Christians, and some, some other religions. And therefore, they're not saying that Tunisia is an Islamic Arab state. This was part of the constitutional consensus of the process. And it's debated and they come to an agreement. So this rules writing process is unbelievably important and it's happening and you hear almost nothing about it in this country. Uh, and, and I think one of the roles of the World Affairs Council and other groups like yours is to let people understand the, the fine points of the discussions going, going on. The next thing that's new is um, a set of new balances. Incredibly important new balances in various arenas, including the balance between, between religiosity and secularism. The role of religion and the role of secular institutions. The second balance is the balance between military authority and civilian authority. A third, I can only give you just headlines because of the time that we can discuss any of these uh, if you want later. The third balance is the balance between public power, public authority, and private authority, private sector. The fourth one is the balance between uh, the central government, which used to hold all power before in the Arab countries, between the central authority and the provincial and regional authorities. In other words, you have decentralized governance or centrally uh, uh, located government. And then the last one is the balance between indigenous values and international foreign values. Then we have the, 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 the most important process underway. I mentioned that uh, legitimacy is, I think, the, the bedrock of what's going on. The Constitution rules writing is the most important mechanism of change. The most important substantive issue that I believe is being debated widely across the region and of which you hear almost nothing in this country in the media or in the public statements or whatever is the process of writing a new social contract that is based on the imperative of social justice. The driving force for these revolutions was not simply to get rid of a dictator. It was to get rid of a dictator and to put in place a mechanism of government that is more fair, more equitable, more accountable, less corrupt, gives more people opportunity, and addresses the fundamental basic needs of the citizenry as equitably as possible. You're not going to treat everybody the same, but to have more equitable opportunities in education and healthcare and job opportunities, etc. This quest for a social contract based on social justice is a powerful driving force that is now pushing thousands of civil society institutions all across the Arab world to come up with a mechanism to translate the concept of social justice into new institutions, new rules, new power structures, new accountabilities. And this is something that takes a long time to develop. And ultimately, if these new institutions and these new phenomena that I described just in quick headlines here, if these actually continue to happen. And all of these things are happening. All of them are new, and all of them are significant. They're historic. But they're historical because they take a long time to play themselves out and to reach a point of maturity. But if they do continue to happen, what they leave us with is a process of self-determination. In other words, we see the citizenry of these countries finally defining themselves choosing their governments, defining the, what's the role of the president, what's the role of the parliament, what's the role of the judiciary, the relationships of power. And the process of self-determination includes then ultimately defining policies and foreign policy and domestic policy. But the big prize is what people really, really want uh, to achieve. Uh, and this takes, takes some 
some time. And the last point I'd make again is to say that this is happening in a context in which people in various dimensions of their lives are battling uh, the last anti-colonial battle. Because overthrowing these regimes is seen to be overthrowing the last remaining remnant of what the colonial powers left behind. And people are fighting for re-legitimization and democratization, social justice, constitutional development, state building, uh, civilian military balance. All of these issues I mentioned, all of them are happening together. And ultimately, we can summarize it in my last one minute, because I'll hit the half hour mark, so we leave half an hour for discussion. I would give you six R's, letter R, uh, that capture, I believe, the main substantive themes or phenomena of these Arab uprisings across the region. This is a process of revolt. People are revolting. This is a citizen revolt against their regimes and their oppression and the various things they complain about. It's a process of seeking rights, that they want to have their rights as citizens. It's a process of seeking respect. They want to be respected by their government, and they want their country to be respected by other countries. And they want the individuals to respect each other in society. It's a process of rebirth. These are countries being born again at the hands of their own people. It's a process of reconfiguration, restructuring the mechanisms of government and the exercise of power and the other dimensions of national life. And finally, it's a process of re-legitimization. To take institutions and in some cases entire countries that were seen to be illegitimate in the eyes of their own people because they were not created by their own people. They were not shaped, they were not defined by their own people. They were, most of these countries were created by retreating European powers. So there's a sense of humiliation and illegitimacy that pervaded much of the Arab world, which is one reason why it was so violent and messy for the last four or five decades. So this is, a, this is an epic journey from humiliation and marginalization to self-assertion and re-legitimization. It's epic, it's historical, it's very moving, it's very powerful, it's very complicated, it takes a long time. It started in many ways in this city 225 years ago. And it's something that is going to be continuing in our cities, hopefully, for the next several decades at least. Thank you very much. very, very thoughtful. And for sure, we don't hear much of that here, so thank you for walking us through it. I know that we'll have questions about the Arab uprisings, but I, I think we'd be remiss if we didn't talk a little bit about the recent news. And if you could help us work through some of the anti-American uh, eruptions that are unfolding and give us a little context. I mean, we know what the catalyst was, but can you help us understand what's happening and, and how you see this unfolding? Yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't have time to, because they told me that they were going to cut my ears off if I went more than half an hour. Um, so, the Arab Israeli issue in Iran and the recent demonstrations, we can touch on them in the Q&A. Uh, on the recent demonstrations, I think it's important to recognize a couple of points. A, there were some criminal elements who deliberately went out to attack and kill Americans, and this is what happened in Benghazi. These criminal elements have been working for the last 15 or 20 years, uh, attacking American targets. So you need to see what happened in Benghazi, not as a direct consequence of the reaction to the film. It happened at the same that the people who planned this attack seem to have done so separately from the film reaction, but they took advantage of the demonstrations to then attack the consulate. They may not even have known that the ambassador was in the consulate. Uh, that's uh, one thing. The second thing is that there was massive uh, anger across the whole Islamic world because of this film. 
but an infinitesimally small number of Muslims went out on the street to demonstrate. Infinitesimally small compared to the Islamic. The number of people who went out to demonstrate in the Islamic world were a few hundred in a, in a few cities, a couple of thousand in one or two places only, and a few dozen in some other cities. It's not to minimize the criminality of the attack in Benghazi, uh, but it, it's important to put these things in perspective. The people who went out on the street to demonstrate uh, proportional to all Muslims were probably about the same number of, of Christian fundamentalists who attacked abortion clinics in this country. Very, very few people in this country attacked abortion clinics, but many people were against, are against abortion. So the question is, what is your sentiment and what is your action? Sentiment is that the majority of Muslims were really angry by this uh, film, because religion plays a huge role in their lives. In the context of countries where there's no democracy, where there's corruption, abuse of power, mismanagement of resources, humiliation, etc., 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 for 30, 40 years, religion emerged as the most important force in most people's lives. It was the last thing they had to hold on to if they were Muslims. And for somebody to come and then make fun of their prophet was a shattering a blow to the last straw they had that held, held, held them together as human beings. So there was genuine anger. Uh, most demonstrations were not violent. They were mostly peaceful. They were shouting, they'd burn a flag or something like that, which is not particularly problematic as long as you don't go and attack people. And a few of them attacked a few uh, installations. And then there was this criminal group that killed the people in the American consulate. So we need to separate those things. And also to recognize that some of this anger that was uh, manifested against American, British, and Israeli targets. There was no Israeli targets, but it was in the slogans, it was against the US, England, and Britain. Gives you a hint about what this is all about. This is a release of anger that is, has accumulated for, for, for decades and decades. And therefore, the antidote, I would, and that's what I said about people feeling that they're not really sovereign. They're fed up with foreign countries telling them what to do and how to run their societies. Uh, and I believe that President Obama misread the reality and most of the commentary in this country, I just wrote my column on this this afternoon here in the hotel so I can read it tomorrow. There's a, there's a, mis, uh, there's a great mis, uh, misconnection going on here between this strong emphasis in the United States on freedom of speech, that we support freedom of speech absolutely and people can say whatever they want. That's fine. But the question is, who sets the rules for the world? And what people across the world are saying is that you can have freedom of speech, but you cannot expect people around the world to play by your rules. Nobody mandated the United States to set the rules of conduct for the entire world. What about if Muslims came and said here uh, that, well, you should be allowed to uh, do things that you should be forced to pay 5% uh, of your uh, income to charity, which is a Muslim requirement, or you should pray five times a day, or you should do this, or you should do that, or you should, you should dress modestly if you're a woman. Muslims believe that. There's 1.5 billion Muslims in the world. Can they impose that on you or on me as a Christian? No, they can't. So the question is not about the sacred nature of the freedom of expression uh, or the fact that many Muslims were upset uh, by the, uh, by the uh, film of the Danish cartoons before. The question is, in the interaction between different countries and cultures, who sets the rules? Who sets the, the ground rules for how people are allowed to behave and what they should put up with and not put up with? And, and I think that I, I was I was deeply disappointed by many press commentaries I've read recently in Obama's speech at the UN the other day where we were essentially were saying, look, you, you know, you Muslims, you better get used to it. We have freedom of speech and people attack me as a politician and, and you better get used to it. This is how the world works. I think that's completely the wrong attitude to take. Of course, it's a presidential election and people have to say certain things because the publics are angry and, and there is a and you should never make decisions or statements in the heat of anger. Americans are, are deeply upset and angered by the killing of the four diplomats, as they should be, and these criminals need to be caught, but we shouldn't confuse uh, short-term anger with uh, longer-term processes of how civilizations and cultures need to interact in a more uh, mutually satisfying 
way. And the last point I'd say quickly is that in these societies, if you take Egypt, for instance, or Tunisia, or Libya, where these events happen mostly, you have these open societies now that I just described going through amazing amounts of change. And some of the events that took place were the consequence of three or four or five different groups trying to go out into the public sphere and claim the mantle of protecting Islam against these foreign aggressors or predators or insulters. And some of that was going on as well, where some people were trying to outdo the others in defending Islam uh, and trying to get more support for them. Themselves. So there, there is a problem uh, of pent-up anti, it's not anti-Americanism, because these same people who are criticizing the U.S. Uh, want to come here and study and work and send their children, but it's, it's a criticism of the American's foreign policy and the Israelis and the British. Those are the three main targets, uh, and I think people need to see this longer cycle of uh, actions and reactions on, uh, on both sides, looking at the Iraq war, other things, and then you have the reaction by people like in Canada, which is a very, very infinitesimal small group of people uh, who attack, criminally attack the United States. So this cycle has to be seen in its full context to be really understood. Okay, we have two mics set up in the front, so please come up and ask a question. We have about 20 minutes, if you can be brief, and please let's have questions. No speeches. Thank you for sharing your insights and some of the background that's going on that we don't know that much about. Would you be willing to share with us some of your recommendations and suggestions for politicians and for the American public on what actions might be taken to help reduce and lessen some of the anti-American sentiment across the population? Okay, why don't we take two or three questions in a row, it's more efficient. Okay. Uh, we visited Tunisia several years ago under the auspice of the World Affairs Council, and one thing that struck us or struck me was that the role of women seemed to be very prominent. In fact, they said that in their constitution, women have equal rights with, in Tunisia. With the world, with the Muslim Brotherhood coming into power, how do you think that will play out? Okay, so she's been so very thoughtful. I wanted to kind of promote you. If you were the leader of the Israelis, head of the Palestinians, and dealing with the whole current scenario, what would be your recommendations for dealing with the scenarios and, and trying to bring about the peace that way? One more, yeah. Um, there's the concern now in the United States and other countries regarding uh, they think the possibility of Iran attacking uh, Israel. Um, do you think that uh, Iran would recognize the consequences of their actions if they, if they did uh, attack Israel? Okay, so we have anti-American sentiment, women's rights in Tunisia, Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and Iran. <laughs> It's good that I know how to do sound bites on TV. You're going to get about two minutes for each. Uh, I'll take them backwards. The, the possibility of Iran attacking Israel is about as big as me playing for the line of Philadelphia Eagles. <laughs> Iran is not going to attack Israel. It'll badmouth it, it'll make crazy statements, it'll use the antagonism against Israel in the Arab world to try to rally support in the Arab world. Uh, but the idea that Iran, I went to Iran last year and I talked to government people, including nuclear negotiators, I talked to opposition for many years, I know Iran well. The idea that Iran would ever attack Israel is the most harebrained idea that could ever be conceived because if they ever even thought of doing that, they would get wiped out by American and Israeli nuclear attacks within 30 minutes. There's just no chance that they're going to do that. And that's about time for people in this country to stop swallowing the Israeli propaganda, and Netanyahu was at the UN today holding up his signs, and you'll see this all over the press tomorrow and all over the TV tonight. I don't think there's any chance that Israel is going to attack, that Iran is going to attack Israel. It will keep badmouthing it, making statements, uh, but uh, at most Israel
Israeli generals now and security people also feel that Israel should not attack uh, Iran. So the Iranians are very aware of the consequences. Uh, they have a political battle with Israel, um, and that political battle has to be dealt with politically, uh, and they have grievances that need to be addressed as much as the Israelis and the Americans and the Europeans have complaints against uh, the Iranians. Israeli-Palestinian policies, um, there's no possibility with the present uh, leaderships in Israel and Palestine of reaching any kind of peace agreement. There needs to be a change. Uh, but I think a peace agreement is still possible if you think back on the Northern Ireland and South Africa and these intractable conflicts that were resolved ultimately. Because two things happened. The people got weary, the old policies became discredited, and, and then uh, new leaders came along, or old leaders saw the light and came to an agreement. And I think something like that has to happen in the Arab-Israeli uh, conflict. It's a tough conflict to solve because both sides need to make concessions. Neither side is prepared now to make the concessions that are required. There is not an external mediator that is fair and effective and accepted by both sides, and there are not strong pressures on either side to make the concessions needed. Therefore, there won't be any major changes now. But if there are not any changes, if nothing happens and no progress is made, pressure will keep building up and keep building up, and we'll have more explosions in the future. If people had solved, if the world and the Arabs and the Israelis had solved the Arab-Israeli crisis in the 1970s and the Palestine issue, there would probably be no Iranian-Israeli antagonism. There would probably be no Hamas or Hezbollah. All of these are post-1980 phenomena, most of which are based on the consequences of the Arab-Israeli conflict. The Palestinian-Israeli conflict has been for 62 years the most destabilizing, radicalizing force in the Middle East, and will continue to do so unless it is resolved fairly, equitably, peacefully, with the Israelis and the Palestinians and the other countries involved, Syria, Lebanon, getting their full rights. Israel continuing to be to live in peace and to be accepted in the Arab world with security guarantees, and the Palestinians having the resolution of their refugeehood done in a manner that is acceptable to the Israelis and in compliance with international law. The uh, Tunisian woman issue. Uh, there are many f concerns among many people about. What would happen if Muslim Brotherhood groups were to gain power? Woman was one issue, tourism, alcohol, schooling, education, minority rights, Christian rights. Most of these fears, I think, have been uh, placated. Most of them, not all of them. There are still real issues that have to be addressed. But what we've seen in Tunisia and what we've seen in Egypt is that the government with the Muslim Brothers is not the primary force of regression. But it is these fundamental Salafi, the more militant, non-violent, but more fundamental, more hardline Muslim groups that are called Salafi. The Salafi means from the forefathers that these are these are Muslims who feel that society should be run according to the way it was run when the Prophet was alive in the seventh century. That we should go back to our roots and live the simple Islamic life as it was back in the seventh century. The vast majority of Muslims reject that. But there are small groups, as there are Christian fundamentalist groups who have similar views. Um, the fears about the women's status and the minority status have largely been delayed, I believe, because of this constitutional struggle. And you've had, uh, once the Islamists become incumbent, they become accountable to all of the population, not just to their constituency. And the pushback has started and the negotiations have started so that these issues of women's status and uh, minority groups and all these things are being negotiated and I believe will be largely uh, will be largely resolved in a manner that is uh, not going to be detrimental to women uh, or minorities in the public realm. What happens privately in people's homes is something that we can't predict. If society becomes more conservative, it might, but I, I don't think that's going to happen. The, uh, what to do to reduce the uh, anti-American sentiments. Again, it's very important, this term anti-Americanism is a very inaccurate term. It's not anti-Americanism, it's anti-American government foreign policies. People are not against what America stands for. In fact, if you, if you go, you should, 
you should look at, uh, you should put on your website, somewhere, I can send you some articles and things about the discussions taking place to create the Tunisian constitution. Very, very moving, very, very impressive. Uh, and it's a very American-like process of discussing individual rights and collective rights and minorities and this and that and power and accountability and equity and justice and uh, equality, etc., etc. So these, uh, these, uh, what people are trying to do in most of these countries that are transforming uh, is to is to emulate many of the American traditions that you have worked out over the last 225 years, 200 and whatever, 35 years. Um, but you have very strong criticisms of American foreign policy uh, because of the nature of American foreign policy. People don't like the fact that you've supported dictators for 50 years. And when the revolution started in January of 2011, the first instinctive reaction from Hillary Clinton and American leaders was, well, you know, let's take it easy and maybe Mubarak can be reformed and Zain Abedin and Ali in Tunisia. Uh, the, the initial reaction was really upsetting to many people in the Arab world because we saw the American government as saying, well, let's keep these guys in place, keep these dictators in place, but maybe they can reform uh, a little bit. So there's real anger against the U.S. for four or five decades of supporting dictators for, for being very, very pro-Israeli instead of being even-handed in the Arab-Israeli conflict and for other, uh, the Iraq war and many other things. And that's what people are expressing. It's not just people who are critical of the United States. People in the Arab world see the United States as the single biggest threat to their national security. This came out on a poll that was done last year across the whole Arab world by a very reputable uh, group that used very scientific methodology. It's called the Arab Center for Research and Analysis in the Doha, Qatar. Uh, and it's available on the website if you want to look at it. It's called the Arab Opinion Index. Um, and anybody who wants it, let me know, I can send you a copy of it circulated. It's the most comprehensive poll of the Arab world done in the last year. And it showed that public opinion in the Arab world sees the U.S. and Israel as the two greatest threats to their countries. The three out of four Muslims surveyed about four years ago, before the uprising, by an American political scientist at the University of Maryland. Three out of four Muslims thought that the United States was a threat to Islam not a threat to their national security, to Islam as their religion. Now, you might say these people are crazy, or they may be, but this is the reality. The, the, the perceptions of the U.S. because of its policies are extremely negative. So the best way to reduce this is to, first of all, have more dialogue with people, find out more about what's going on in these countries, on the Iran situation, your, your, your mass media and your public uh, officials' pronouncements are criminally negligent in giving you both sides of the story. The Iranians can be held accountable for many troubling things, but they need to be engaged just as they want to engage you on the basis of discussing the mutual concerns of both sides. And this hasn't happened uh, yet. The press needs to look at what people in the Arab world are saying, what the Iranians, what the Turks, what the Israelis, and just deal with the realities out there more than simply accepting uh, hook, line, and sinker of propaganda and ideological work by uh, lobby groups and special interest groups and, and others, whether they represent foreign countries or religious groups, or, and that includes Christian fundamentalist groups and right wing groups and neocons, Israelis, and uh, different, all kinds of different groups. Uh, there's a problem in analyzing the Middle East in this country in a factual and objective way. And until that is done, we are likely to continue to suffer these kinds of pressures. Yes, uh, your sixth R had to do with real legitimacy and the desire to rid a country of the colonial foreign governments. And I was wondering what the attitude is of the Arab world in general, as well as the people who live in the countries of Afghanistan and Iraq. Attitudes to Afghanistan and Iraq. Do they, do they view it in a similar way that they were governments that were kind of formed by the United States? Or is there real legitimacy that they do believe that they are democratically elected uh, officials and they accept that? Do you perceive that the negative perceptions of America will affect the new governments in the Middle East? Thanks, Dan. 
much for speaking with us today. I really appreciate your emphasis of sovereignty, self-determination, and how this takes a process, just like it did in the United States. But unless sovereignty is the most important value in international affairs, what role can the United States play in shaping what will become for the, um, the countries going through these processes? What, say what, what, what role does the United States play in shaping these processes? The, the transformations in the Arab world? Yeah, especially if human rights violations occur. Sorry, you mentioned three and I'm the fourth side of the I'll get on my time. Uh, one thing I would, I'd like to, to address is what influence did Iraq, the growth of Iraqi democracy have on the Arab uprising? Number two, there were reports that, I mean, not reports, I mean, we know that the Egyptian uprising started with students. There was a student uprising where it was sort of hijacked by the Muslim Brotherhood. So if you can, if you care to comment on that. And finally, uh, we haven't talked about Afghanistan. Sorry, the second one yeah, you were saying that you, you think you think that the uprising in Egypt was more or less an Sunni uprising was no student. It started to student. student. Ah, okay. okay. And eventually students. And one more thing, if you don't mind. Well, we really, we really would like to get the last. Okay, the last one. Uh, a comment on Afghanistan. No comment. Let's, let's, what's your They're not my comment. I'd like him to comment. Okay. Um, Thanks. Uh, just a quick question. You, uh, this is about journalistic credibility. Uh, you alluded to during your presentation about mainstream media's uh, brushstroking errors on, you know, kind of just a general theme. Um, I'm hoping that you can guide us and advise us tonight in what uh, possible media outlets there are out there that share the accurate portrayal of great daily realities out in the Middle East and also perhaps the most objective analysis and uh, if you could exclude the Daily Star <laughs> no, but uh, okay. I think we got that's it. it. We got it. Good. Okay. You have to leave. Your train is in. <laughs> there, is, there is your talk. So. Okay. All right. Quick answers to all of these. Um, Re-legitimization vis-a-vis uh, -vis Iraq and Afghanistan. Neither Iraq nor Afghanistan are perceived in the Arab world as being processes of re-legitimization. They're processes of foreign-imposed um, um, new government systems that are not working very well. Afghanistan and Iraq are the two greatest sources of terrorist Al-Qaeda people in the world right now. If you're worried about Qaeda-type terrorists, including the guys who killed your diplomats in Benghazi, you need to go back and ask why, what happened in Iraq when the Americans and the British invaded Iraq, making it the biggest magnet training ground and exporters of experienced terrorists uh, in the last quarter century. And Afghanistan and Iraq are both huge messes. The governments are not very credible. Uh, they're, uh, they're increasingly becoming more autocratic. So I don't, there's no, no perception among uh, large numbers of people at all of those being legitimate processes because they were fundamentally the consequence of foreign wars, foreign invasions. The negative view of the U.S. and the new governments, um, if you get more democratic Arab governments that are democratic and legitimate and reflect more accurately public opinion in their countries, that should be in itself a good thing for everybody. You should, you should work for that because that's what your country is based on, that this, the consent of the government matters. That all human beings are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, all human beings. And so you should, in principle, support democratic transitions in our countries. If they then reflect public opinion, which is critical of the United States, you then have to draw on your second level of great American values, which is to fix the problem. Why are people critical of the United States? And understand that the same people who are criticizing the United States are coming here to study and to work and to, uh, to go to um, get health care, et cetera, et cetera, and buy American products uh, over there. So it needs to be a deep analysis of the, of the reasons for the foreign policy problems in both directions. If you have criticisms of the Arabs, you need to, they need to understand your motivations and your policies just as you need to understand them better. But there will be more criticism of the U.S. There will be more independence 
uh, in governments, but this should lead to then mechanisms of solving problems through negotiations, through agreements, etc. The U.S. role in the Arab uprisings, um, the United States should essentially respond to what the uh, people of those countries ask for. Uh, if they ask for certain assistance, if they need help in training judges, if they need help in setting up uh, parliaments, of which they don't, because they've been running the societies for about the last 5,500 years, they know how to do uh, governance issues. But if they ask you for something, if the Syrian rebels have asked you for arms, if the people in Bahrain ask you for more balanced policy between the Bahraini government and the Bahraini opposition, you should respond to what you think is the will of the majority. Because that's what it's all about. If you cherry pick where you're going to help people and where you're not going to help them, and you, you will get yourself into the mess that you're in now, which is you're saying that you support democracy and freedom and equal rights of the rule of law, but you don't do that in your policies. United Nations resolutions are implemented in Iraq and Kuwait with warfare. You generate armies and go and liberate these countries from occupation, which is the right thing to do. But you don't do anything about if equal magnitude for the same UN resolutions that are critical of Israel or other Arab countries. So if you, 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 if you support rule of law and democracy and Human rights, you need to do it more consistently. Uh, and this is how I think the US can be the most useful, is responding to what people are saying across the board. You can't say I'm going to help the uprising in Syria, but not help the uprising in Bahrain or somewhere else. It's difficult. It's, consistency is difficult, but I think it's a critical element. The Iraq democracy, Iraq is not seen as a real democracy. Iraq is seen as a uh, uh, as a failed uh, experiment in uh, neocon fantasy. Uh, it's a terrible, uh, terrible uh, episode in modern history that uh, resulted in hundreds of thousands being killed, four million Iraqi refugees, three trillion dollars is the cost to you over the next 10 years in terms of health care and other things that you're going to have to keep paying for. The most, uh, the most substantial export of uh, trained Qaeda uh, terrorist militants uh, in the last quarter century uh, coming out of Iraq. Uh, it was really one of the most stupid and criminal acts that uh, American foreign policy has ever done, in my view. Sure, you never of a dictator, but the, look what the Arabs did to get rid of the dictators. Much better way to do it to have your own people liberate themselves than to do it uh, through an army. So what's left behind is not a credible democracy in Iraq. One day they will solve their problems and they will figure out how to restructure and reconfigure. And of course Iran is now extremely influential in Iraq as well. Um, the students in Egypt, the, 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 the revolutions across the Arab world were youth-led, but were not youth revolutions. The same grievances that young people talk about across the Arab world, corruption, that to dictators, lack of jobs, etc. The same grievances that youth manifested were reflected among the adults. The youth were the first element out there, which is what happens with youth. It's because of hormones, and it's because of the people's age, and they're worried, and, the, and young people get out. But then, so this shouldn't be seen as a student or youth revolt, but it was just youth led. The grievances are shared by, by all. And the, the media, the problem with the media all over the world, not just in the United States, uh, is that everywhere, including here, as you know, in your country, it's become more polarized, more commercialized, more trivialized. It's about entertainment more than about public affairs and views. Uh, and this is happening all over the world. So it's very difficult to say, here's one news source that will give you a fair overview of everything. But there are, I think what you have to do is go pick out a few news sources to complement what you're already getting here in your mainstream media. In the US, I would say NPR and PBS uh, do probably the best job of mainstream media. But I would look at The Guardian out in England, the BBC in England, the Jazeera website in English is very good. There's a, there's a website coming out of the United States called Jadalia, which is J-A-D-A-L-I-Y-A, Jadalia. Uh, and it's a very, very good website that is run by a bunch of uh, Americans who are at universities and all over the U.S. And most of them are Americans, but not all of them. 
And they have wonderful analyses about what's going on uh, in the Arab world. So there's, there are alternate sources now that are available, and you have to go and find other sources to complement what you're already getting uh, in your media, which is, is a little bit deficient in, in most of these cases. If any of you are interested in my analyses and my columns that I write twice a week, you can just go to the website with my name on it, rangifuri.com, and it, you can read my columns for, uh, for free. And if any of you are publishers, you're welcome to publish them and pay the syndication agency. Thank you very much. <laughs>